Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, he believes that the new Snarl lands from Strixhaven should only tap for mana if you actually snarl while you tap them. That's Matt Morgan. So a friend of mine was building a house and he asked the architect, how much would it be to, to put a chimney on it? And the architect said, well, nothing, it's on the house. <laughs> That's, uh, is it on the house or is it like on the side of the house? That's... I think you're looking too much into this. Um, that's it was a, it's a roofing joke. <laughs> so. And we know those are, those are hard to come by, so... That's that's fair. I'm mostly just trying to resist laughing, as I always do, at your terrific dad The jokes. roofing joke went over Joey's head. It did. It, it very much did. And you can already hear him up next. He's going to teach us a lesson about magic. And that lesson is that the lesson mechanic doesn't do much for EDH because we don't have sideboards. That's Dana Roach. Oh, we just got a survey in from Wizards of the Coast this week, and if I read it right, they were hinting at this new subscription model where once a month someone comes to my house and just leaves a stack of cards in my desk. Um, and that's kind of nice because then I don't have to do it myself once a month. So uh, <laughs> I am going to be into that, I think. It seems convenient. I'm glad you found a subscription model that works for you, Dana. Congratulations, question mark. Anyway, <laughs> this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the EDH RecCast, what we like to do is give all that data a little more context. So Dana, tell us, what is it that we're discussing in this week's episode? We're talking about the... Uh EDH heuristics slash personal principles we have. That we are. EDH now stands for Elder Dragon Heuristics. Is, is that what I'm gathering? Um, I, I don't know, know if that's going to get any traction there, Jim. Yeah, I, I feel like mm. it doesn't really have the, um, doesn't roll off your tongue quite like Elder Dragon Highlander. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's very, that's very fair. But yeah, just some stuff that we've uh, brought to the table whenever we find ourselves in the deck building uh, milieu, I guess you could say. Like stuff that when we are building decks, we found to be really, really helpful to lean back on to help us out with all of the mentally taxing energy of building decks and of playing games. Just some cool principles that we thought would be helpful for other people who are going through those same processes of deck building and some cool tips for gameplay as well. So it should be a whole bunch of fun. Of course, before we get there, we want to take a brief pause and thank the folks at the Command Zone who handle all of the post-production work that we do on our podcast, making it look as spiffy as it does. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors for the show too. Yeah, the EDH RecCast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player. Card Kingdom has the deepest buy list online and a stacked inventory to match. So whatever Strixhaven singles best fit your deck, they will have them. Similarly, our other sponsor, TCG Player, is going to have any card you're going to want from the new Commander 2021 decks. Uh, whichever school best appeals to you, they're going to have it. Just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question and to choose the vendor link down below. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you'd prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. We have Patreon tiers of all sorts of levels, whether you want to check out all the historic challenge, challenge the stats picks that we have done, or you just want to see everything a day early. We have another level available over at Patreon where you can check out all of the episodes and they come out a day early for all those special patrons there as well. Um, so just make sure you head over to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast and you can support the show directly that way. And we even have a special tier over at this Patreon page where we shout out a very special patron every single week just for being signed up to support us. So this week we do want to give a big shout out to Ross LaVere. Thank you so much, Ross. We appreciate the support and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Ross. It's awesome to get the support from folks on Patreon. It's a really lovely Discord. It's really cool to get those extra perks, and we just appreciate the support. But even if you're not supporting on Patreon, even liking, subscribing, that stuff is also great too. But Ross, thank you very much as well. All right, let's do one more bit before we get to the topic, actually, too, because you know what? We have a stream, and it's really fun. Twitch.tv slash EDH RecCast. You can find us there every Wednesday evening playing awesome Commander games with awesome folks from the community. Matt, who do we got coming on to our show in this coming week? So this week, we have a very special guest coming on. You might recognize them from Game Nights or a certain YouTube show that they're doing over um, called I Hate Your Deck. Uh, we have Joseph <laughs> Johnson coming on, and hopefully he doesn't hate our decks because I tend to like... <laughs> 
a few of them at least, um, but we'll see how it goes. But we are very excited to have Joseph on. Yeah, it is such a cool channel. I hate your deck. And that's Joseph Johnson at Black Nito underscore on Twitter. He is really rad and I hope that he likes our decks too. But let's be real. He's raffle stomped in game nights and he's probably going to raffle stomp us as well. So definitely tune in for the stream twitch.tv slash idiot It's a whole bunch of fun and you'll watch us get completely clobbered. That's what people usually watch when they tune in on Wednesday night, <laughs> to, to be honest. So yeah. It's true. It's true. All right, fellas, let's get to our main topic now. We're talking about some, I'm going to try and make it stick, Elder Dragon heuristics, or just some deck building principles that we think are pretty important and that folks should stick to when they are trying to sort through all the data on EDH Rack or when they're trying to compile one of their own decks as well. The first point that I want to uh, bring up here is one that all three of us kind of brought to the table when we were assembling notes here, and that's just the concept that value isn't victory and that value can sometimes be the enemy of victory. You cannot, as they say, value your opponents to death. It's just not going to happen. So you want to watch out for that. Dana, what are some examples of how that might come up in the game? Um, you know, the one I always think of is blink decks where the plan is to just blink things that generate value over and over and over again. You see that with Muldrifter pretty frequently. And that's good. You, you want to generate value, but that isn't going to win you the game. You need to have some plan about how you can spend the value you generate um, and use it to purchase a, a win, essentially. Sure. And I think this is a this is a thing that we saw back in the early days of Commander. Um, you know, even like six, seven years ago, people didn't always talk about their win conditions. Their win condition was just having the most resources at the end of the hour or two hours or whatever it was. Um, and sometimes I think people have forgotten the game has changed a little bit and just outvaluing people isn't always enough to get it done. Well, and ever since the commanders in the past few years, that same time frame you were talking about, Dana, commanders have kind of had that value that, you know, you could have used in previous years that just have it baked in like commanders like Corvold the Fake Cursed King or mm. Muldrotha the Gravetide, like both of those commanders, they just do so much in terms of accruing all that value that, sure, you might have this Brago Blink deck that, you know, you built five, six, seven years ago, and it did fine back then, but it, it can't keep up now because in addition to getting all of that value, those other decks, you know, the, the Corvolds and the Muldrothas, those actually are, are advancing a game plan other than, okay, I'm going to blink Muldrifter and I'm going to blink this thing and I'm going to blink this thing. Like, they're set out to get the value, but they're also just using it to win the game immediately. I think Corvold's especially an interesting example there because it powers itself up so it can swing in for a bunch of damage. Mm -hmm. uh, attacking someone to death with a Brago seems like a, a much more labored process, I guess is how I'll phrase it. But even Muldrotha, I think like that's a commander that you do need to probably, like getting back a Reclamation Sage from the graveyard every turn, getting back a couple of enchantments every turn, like that is fun, but that's not going to win the game on its own. You should have something in there that is also going to like push, like this is the end game spot now that this deck can actually do. And Brago is such actually an interesting example when it comes to that because there are Brago players who will rely on cards like Stryonic Resonator, which duplicates the triggered ability of Brago, which can then blink, come back in untapped, and then you can do it again. There's like this pretty infamous combo with Brago, Mana Rocks, and the Stryonic Resonator card. And Brago players, I think, have kind of wisely leaned into exactly that to avoid it becoming just a value fest of a game and actually turning the, like, that's an actual end game so that the game can finally be over and they're not just blinking things over and over again with no actual closing plan. Well, that's the big thing is, yeah, just being able to know when to shift gears from that value mm -hmm. plan and, you know, okay, I need to get into attack mode now. I can't just sit here and, and sit comfortably. Um, I only can have, you know, 97 cards in hand. So what good is another one going to do? <laughs> I, I love that you said 97 cards in hand, but I also love that you said attack mode. Are we playing Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> couldn't tell you how to spell Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. We're always kind of playing Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's a really important point. Value isn't necessarily victory. Don't let value be the enemy to victory. Drawing cards is nice, but make sure that those cards are doing something that helps you actually finish your opponents off so that your opponents can't draw more cards. It's really important. Dana, take us to our next point. What's something else that is a good principle to bring to the fore when you are building or playing EDH? Well, you just talked about drawing cards and how that doesn't win you the game. Um, but do you know what it does? Uh, solves a lot of problems. <laughs> It, it, yes. do, it doesn't solve every problem every time, but it solves a lot of problems a lot of the time. 
Um, and, you know, there are situations where your deck isn't doing a certain thing. And so, so like, say you're missing land drops regularly, you probably should verify that your deck has enough lands. And, and if it doesn't, you can fix that by adding more lands. Um, but if your deck does have enough lands, just draw more cards and you're going to see those lands more frequently. <laughs> Um, and that applies to a whole bunch of different things. You know, if you feel like your deck doesn't have enough answers, doesn't have enough removal, maybe it doesn't, and you should verify that it does. But if it does, just see those removal spells more often by drawing more cards. Like, there's a whole bunch of things that applies to. Um, so just adding draw to your deck doesn't necessarily fix a lot of your problems, but I would bet way more often than not, it does. This is kind of the reason that I'm not playing stuff like Armillary Sphere to go find lands and put them into my hand. Because if I have enough draw sources or just general card advantage sources, that will help me find the land drops that I need instead anyway. Well, and sometimes too, just you, you come into situations and you, like Dane has pointed out on the podcast before, I've never felt, oh man, I wouldn't have won that game if I had, you know, less cards in hand. Uh, some <laughs> Sometimes, you know, just having the the resources available, like we, and it's, I know it's kind of a counterpoint to what we just said, you know, where value isn't victory, but being able to have enough resources to close the game out is very different than just spinning your wheels for the sake of spinning your wheels. Having, you know, enough card draw to help you accomplish whatever you set out to do in that game, that's always going to be fairly helpful. Right. And I, Dana, I really love the point that you brought up. It might be that you actually do have enough board wipes in the deck and you do have enough removal spells in the deck. You just don't have the deck velocity to get to find them. But if you had more deck velocity, you would find them more reliably. So it's not that you need to spruce up the other categories in your deck. It's that something like card advantage is going to help you find those things. And this may sound a little bit at odds with the previous point we made about how value doesn't necessarily equal victory. Um, but in this case, we're talking about using that card draw to find the actual victory that you put in your deck. So mm -hmm. once you've baked those things in, you just want to make it easier to get to them. And this is this is how you do it. Draw is the best way to find those cards. Yeah, very much. And, and honestly, I feel like the card advantage situation kind of, it, I feel like it's a much bigger part of the conversation when it comes to color combinations like mono white, for instance, where like the adage is that mono white sucks at ramp and card draw. And like, I don't think that's true because I don't think mono white sucks at ramp any more than Rakdos or Azorius do, but Rakdos and Azorius have more card velocity to consistently hit land drops, which is the thing that mono white doesn't necessarily have. But the problem isn't ramp necessarily. The problem is just card advantage to consistently hit those things. That's how it feels to me is that card advantage solves that particular problem. The actual source of the problem is the card advantage, not anything about ramp in that instance. Well, we just got this new card in um, the most recent set, uh, Archaeomancer's map that actually goes and gets you lands. Um, so, you know, that's not true card draw, but it also has kind of a ramp baked in because whenever somebody else is going to go play a land, you can play one of those lands you went and fetched um, with the map to kind of catch you up to them. So it does multiple things right there at once. It kind of gets cards into your hand and it lets you get ahead of other people or at least catch up to other people if someone's ahead of you. That, that solves a lot of problems on one card. Yeah, very much. All right, let's move now to our next point here. And this is sort of a personal one for me. And I wonder if you guys feel the same way. I just like my victory condition in a deck to feel like it quote, belongs in that deck. Like it's somehow tethered to that commander in an honest way. An example that I'll use here is the card Wound Reflection in my Virtus and Gorm deck. Wound Reflection doubles the life loss of every opponent at each end step. Like it's just so much fun. If you've lost 10 life, you're going to lose 10 more. And Virtus famously can poke someone and then make them lose half their damage. And if Ashlyn Rose is the one editing this video for us, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. That was really fun to make you lose half your life, and your reaction to it was delightful. But following that up with a Rune Reflection, it's totally game, because they lose half their life, and then they lose the other half their life. Wound Reflection feels like a great victory condition in that deck, but I'm not going to put Wound Reflection, good as a card as it can be, into other decks, because it doesn't feel like it belongs necessarily. If I win in my Sir Conrad deck by doubling up the damage with a Wound Reflection, it doesn't feel right somehow. Does that make sense to you guys? Is that also a thing that you identify with in your deck building? Well, you, for me, 100%. Uh, I wouldn't build an Omnath Locus of Rage deck if I didn't want to be doing things around Omnath Locus of Rage. <laughs> like, that kind of, for me, I've always, and you guys can attest to this, anybody who's watched twitch.tv slash EDH on Wednesday evenings can attest, pretty much all of my decks 
by and large, revolve around what am I doing with that commander, whether it's Omneth Locus of Rage, whether it's Valduk Keeper of the Flame, or even Alila, the, the Artful Provocateur, where I'm maximizing all those. Like, if I'm playing a game and my commander just cannot be cast, chances are I'm not doing very much that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and what's interesting with this one, too, is like this is where it kind of it crosses into what I would say is personal preference. Um, generally speaking, I think a couple of the previous things we talked about are adages that make sense in almost any situation. You know, value isn't victory. Drawing cards does help with a lot of things. Those things are, are, are true in all cases. This one here, we're getting to things now that are a little more personal, and I am completely on board with this. I feel the same way. I want a deck to win the way that deck is designed to win. Um, Torment of Hailfire is an amazing mm. card. But there's nothing about Torment to Hailfire that's unique to whatever deck you're running in for the most part. Like maybe in a Bolas deck or something. But like if you're playing black and the game goes to turn 10, well, Torment Hellfire is going to win you the game probably. It's a great card. But it doesn't feel like it was a, a condition that that deck got you to the point where it, it was going to win you the game. So I, I am completely with you here that like as far as personal adages go, um, that's one that I kind of stick to as well. Uh, Torment of Hailfire is actually such a perfect example. I've got a Sir Conrad deck that is mono black, and you know with Cabal Coffer stuff, mono black can make mm -hmm. a lot of mana. So something like Torment of Hailfire, I would totally understand folks who say that that does definitely belong because the mana production with Cabal Coffers, sure. like, heck yes, that sounds awesome. But for me, it is, uh, as a preference note, I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I actually want to do some Tombstone Stairwell stuff and some, I want to rip a bunch of creatures out of the graveyard with a foot bottom feast so that Conrad deals damage when the creatures leave my graveyard because it feels more unique and it, more like it belongs to that commander in a more unique way than a Torment of Hailfire. I could probably up my win percentage by including a Torment of Hailfire in that mono black list, but I just don't want to because what I want to do is have some weird fun by killing people with a foot bottom feast instead because that's just something that I prefer for a little bit more. So that is another personal heuristic point that I do. I like my victory to feel like it belongs to that commander in a unique way. I hope that that resonates with you guys as well. Yeah, very much so. All right. And Dana, take us to another point that you've jotted down here. So, so the next one I will jump to here is um, a heuristic that I, I think is also kind of generally applicable to most decks. Um, and that is you should make your answers be answers to multiple problems. Um, Enchantments are oftentimes um, value machines in Commander. They are going to just generate a ton of value over the course of the game, and they're kind of difficult to remove as well. Um, so you want to ideally have things in your deck that can deal with a, a troublesome enchantment. Um, Erase is a card in white for a single white mana that exiles an enchantment. And it's in just 500 decks, and we've never done a challenge of stats on it for good reason. <laughs> Because it just deals with one single card type once. Um, you would almost always be better off with something in your deck in that slot that can hit an enchantment or an artifact. Or in the case of Generous Gift, hit almost anything. Or in the case of, you know, Disenchant even, hit artifact and enchantment. You want to have ways in your deck to solve a problem, but you don't want to find yourself holding that card in hand and not have the one problem that can solve exist. Well, and, and we've always kind of preached a little bit about having just diversity in your answers, whether you're looking to get rid of utility cards or looking to get rid of creatures. Like you don't want 100% single target removal, but you also don't want 100% wraths, for example. And mm -hmm. this kind of carries over and, and resonates a lot with me, actually, on this point, because Dana, like you said, yeah, you can have a very specific card. Or you could do something a little more flexible. Maybe you, you give up on maybe the efficiency of the card. But you're getting so many more uses out of it because it applies to so many more situations that are going to come across in any given game, not just against your buddy's very specific deck. And there are so many ways that this manifests, too. Like, I, I think I would generally prefer an instant that removes a creature just at instant speed, even if it's only removing one creature type, to a sorcery that can remove any creature type. Obviously, mana cost dependings, but an instant may only be restricted, like a Path to Exile is the classic example, example here. Like, yeah, that only kills, you know, it can only pick off a creature compared to a sorcery that could get rid of any permanent. But saving my neck during an oncoming surprise combat, that is a versatility. That is flexibility. That does respond to different game states in a way that a sorcery would not. So that's another type of flexibility to pay attention to. 
Well, one card that you mentioned um, earlier, Joey, was Armillary Sphere. That's an artifact for two mana that you can spend two to crack to go get two basic lands to your hand. Um, that solves a problem of you not having lands in your hand. But what if you have four lands in your hand? <laughs> then that, right, like, like that, then, then you're holding an artifact that accomplishes nothing. If you have draw in your hand in that slot, and we, you know, draw solves problems, um, that's almost never going to be dead. Like even if you're holding ten cards, twelve cards is better than ten, and and you're you're not limited you're limited to having as many bombs as you can as you can get as many choices as you have. So I mean, some of these tie together, and I think this one does tie together to a degree with you know draw solves problems as well. You just really like drawing cards, is what I'm Love hearing. It, it just sounds best. like. Uh, we, value isn't victory. We tried. We made that our first point for a reason, Dana. We did. Anyway, uh, but so this is also kind of opening into another discussion too about the diversity of removal because I think there is a point that sometimes the cost that you're paying is maybe a little bit too much to get that diversity. I have a love-hate relationship with the card Utter End. It's four mana to exile any, I think it's non-land permanent, but like that's a really diverse removal spell. And I don't play it because four mana feels like it's wrath territory to me. And I just feel like that is too much of a mana cost to get that type of diversity. Do you guys feel the same way? Matt, how do you think about Utter End? I actually, I like Utter End. There are just a lot of different ways and in, in trade-offs that Watsi has found a way to kind of incorporate in. Like you, you can compare Anguish on Making to Utter End, and those are very, very similar cards in what they're doing. One just has a little bit cheaper mana, but also has a little bit of a trade-off with the life. So a lot of people, just depending on, on what they're prioritizing, like so I know some folks would definitely be like, heck no, I'm not paying life. Like, why would I pay two life for a land to come into play untapped? I'm not going to do that. But then you'll have other players who are more than happy to pay four life for one card in hand. <laughs> I can't think of anybody who thinks that's a good payoff. Dana? It looks pointed you know, maybe thing. on occasion I would, I would do that <laughs> four been... is low Dana takes every single card <laughs> that he draws off of a Sylvan library but it's beyond that he's also like sacrificed up to 17 to 19 life for the sake of maintaining the monarchy like this guy wants to draw so many cards and he will pay any amount of life to do even just one of them it's <laughs> well done Matt well done I mean, I, I do if, I mean. if you're gonna live live dangerously <laughs> apparently uh, but okay so there's also i guess one other point that i feel like i want to hit on here too and that is the type of like there are specific types of removal that kind of function as silver bullets that i feel like need to be inserted into this conversation too there are cards like containment priest for example that are removal effects against opponents in a specific way where if they would try and cheat creatures into play containment priest is like nah that is not going to happen and that responds to a very specific type of strategy so to say but it could be totally dead against other types of players dana where would you say that you fall on things like that when they could be silver bullets but could still be dead is there room for those in this heuristics that you've put forward or no i, I think so um you know it depends on on how effective the card is too um if it's going to stop you from losing the game and containment priest is a kind of card that sometimes does that or if you're in an environment where can or, or a meta for example where where containment priest effect is almost always going to be useful. That's a little bit different than just generically running containment priest with no idea what decks you're going to be seeing. So like a lot of this stuff is really flexible. And, and actually we can go back to the utter end card you talked about, Joey. Um, <clears throat> the problem with utter end costing four mana is that as an instant speed effect, you want to leave four mana free to have it as an option in case something goes wrong. If nothing goes wrong, you've you know, kind of quote unquote wasted four mana by not spending it. But if you are playing in a deck where your commanders are routinely in play and have a mana sink, like Regna and Krav, for example, so you can utilize that mana if you don't need it on the other end, well, then it becomes a much better card than if you're playing in a deck where mm. if you don't cast it, it's just going to go to waste or you're going to feel like you have to use it so the mana doesn't get unspent. So a lot of this stuff, I think, is there, there's no necessarily universally correct answer. A lot of it depends on the situation. See, I was hoping that you would just say, no, those ultra specific silver <laughs> bullets just aren't worth playing because then that would make you stop playing the graveyard, graveyard exile yeah, effects. I knew that's where that was going. Yes. Yeah, folks, like th this is no, no, we're, we're changing the point that Dana made. No, we're going to stick to it. Your <laughs> your answer should be very diverse. They shouldn't be ultra specific. So you should never run stuff like Majuka Bog or Scavenger Grounds because that's too specific. You might run into a game where no one's playing a graveyard deck. It could happen. Those effects wouldn't be any good. Right, guys? Right, Matt? Back me up here, please. Back me up. I'm not back. 
backing you up on this at all. <laughs> you stop your blasphemous <laughs> act. That's blasphemous act's a different thing. We'll, we'll talk well, about that later, Matt. We'll get we'll get to that yo, one later on. Okay. <laughs> Oh, man, you guys. Okay, so those are some interesting points for us that we carry into gameplay and to deck building. But let's pause for just a second and move to another segment that we really like, and that is challenge the stats. There's so much data on EDA Trek, but you know what? We don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards see too much play or too little play. So what we'd like to do is challenge those stats here. So my challenge of stats this week is going to be one that I actually, it seems to be popping up a lot on a lot of the more popular mono red commanders, but not one that I was actually looking at specifically. And so this card that I think is, is you know, could get a little more love is going to be Tilanali's Summoner. It's one in a red for a 1-1 one, one human shaman, uh, has a send, which means as long as you have 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. And then whenever Tilanali's Summoner attacks, you may pay X in a red, and if you do, you create X. 1 1 red elemental creature tokens tapped and attacking. And then at the beginning of the next end step, you exile those tokens unless you have the city's blessing. Now, I originally was thinking, oh, this would be kind of cool for Joey's Martin Stromgald deck because if you can stack hmm. your triggers correctly, you can get a whole bunch of attack triggers because Martin Stromgald cares about how many creatures are attacking whenever his hmm. ability resolves. Um, but Tillanali Summer is getting played in 84% of Martin Stromgald decks. That's quite a few. <laughs> we don't need any more help there. But one place that I did think it was kind of curious, actually, is Torbrin Thane of the Red Fell. So Torbrin Thane of the Red Fell it reads, if a, if a red source you control would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus two instead. So when you're making an army of one ones, they effectively become three ones with Torbrin out on the battlefield. And if you've watched over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast, how well my Valda <laughs> Keeper of the Flame deck does with all those three ones, you'll know that damage adds up super, super fast. He's um, not wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and Till and Ollie Summoner is only being played in 14% of Torbrin decks so far. And when you compare it to a lot of these other mono red commanders like Martin Stromgald, like Subira Tulzi Caravaneer, uh, they're doing quite a bit of work. And I think that in Torbrin decks as well, Till and Ollie Summoner can do equally as much work. So I think that number should get pumped up just a little bit there. Matt, I, I have to circle back to something that you mentioned about like, oh, it looks like all of the Martin Stromgold players are already playing to Linali Summoner in those decks and like a good percentage. There's only like 30 Martin Stromgold decks but, in the database total. <laughs> which means you're the only one not doing it so far. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> You're the, you're the Dane of Martin Stromgold. Congratulations. <laughs> I have been put on the spot, called out, and man, I'm living for it. That was it cuts <laughs> deep. well done, mister. All right. I'm going to move from mono red to mono blue with my challenge here. I'm looking at Bruvac the Grandiloquent, the double mill commander from Jumpstart, who is pretty expensive, so there's not too many out there in the world, which is a shame. Wizards, please reprint Jumpstart. But I have a bit of personal experience with Bruvac because my brother has a Bruvac deck. We call it Bruvac because, of course, we do. Bruvac is really interested in all of the different things that can mill people from mesmeric orb to classic persistent petitioners to traumatize and maddening cacophony, just ways to absolutely clobber an enemy's deck and double up the mill and get some really, really good effects there. I think that there are kind of enough good effects for Bruvac to be dealing with though. There's a lot of stuff going on here and even some of the core sets have introduced more and more just automatic mill triggers that will happen. So when I see a card like Drowned Secrets in a Bruvac deck, a two mana enchantment that says whenever you cast a blue spell, target player mills two cards, I gotta say that compared to all the rest of its contemporaries on this page, that enchantment feels to me like a bit of a distraction that's not going to put in nearly as much work as what the rest of them are doing. And when it comes to cuts that you got to make for this very specific type of deck to try and mill people out, that one seems like it's going to fall pretty quickly behind the rest. So I would recommend looking pretty critically at stuff like Drown Secrets in a Brovac deck. I mean a Brovac deck, or do I? So, so you're talking about specificity this week, not parasophosity. Yes, we're, we're not talking about parasiticity. We are talking about specificity. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> oh, man. Dana, take us to your challenge. Round this out. <laughs> So, so I have a challenge that was brought to us by a uh, little-known person, Josh Murphy, uh, who you can find on Twitter at <laughs> also named Josh. And you can sometimes find actually working at Command Zone, occasionally editing this podcast. Um, I, don't know, I don't know who that is. I have uh, no idea who you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> um, so, so the card um, Murph brought up was Scarscale Ritual. 
which is from way back in the Lorwyn block, and it's one and a Demir hybrid mana, so two total, for a sorcery that says, as an additional cost to play Scar Scale Ritual, put a minus one, minus one counter on a creature you control, and then draw two cards. Um, Blue has kind of struggled in recent memory having real, th- those really efficient draw spells. It has bomb draw spells and it has really good filtering or things like brainstorm or ponder, but it doesn't really have those things that like just net you two cards for less than divination mana. So in that two mana range, until we recently got chart of course and winged words, Blue didn't do that really well. Black did it much better with their kind of Knight's Whisper or Sign of Blood effects. Mm-hmm. Scarscale Ritual is in that same league. It's a two mana draw two with the only downside being you have to put a minus one, minus one counter on something, which, you know, okay, you put it on a, on a token creature that kills it, which black things are often doing with like Ultra's Reap or Costly Plunder. It's just one more option you have in that kind of deck. And it's only in 60. 61 total decks on EDH rec for a two mana draw spell that you can play in a deck that's got both black and blue. I think it's a really efficient card that works really well in a kind of deck that particularly wants to put things in the graveyard to just get two cards. Um, I like it and it should be more than 61 decks. So thank you, Murph, for, for mentioning Scar Scar Ritual, a card I forgot about. Yeah, well, Murph, thank you so much for that suggestion, whoever you are, wherever it is that you work. We've never heard of you before. So yeah, Murph, thank you, whoever you may be. Well, if you want to go to a place where you may have heard of, you you may have visited before, um, you can over to altersleeves.com slash EDH Retcast. Uh, Alter Sleeves is the new and official sponsor of the Challenge Stats segment. And we definitely want to let people know that you can head over to their site and you can get all sorts of just awesome artwork that you know you don't have to have altered directly on a card you can have it put on a sleeve put that sleeve to protect your card that you don't want marked up but it still gets that awesome artwork on there it's just a great website great service um altersleeves.com slash edh retcast and that'll let you know or let them know that we sent you over there yeah really really cool stuff there we highly highly recommend and we may have something cooking on that as well may have something dubious and (laughs) <laughs> dubious is a great word for it but yeah, it's, that, it's, it's that secret's still under wraps more info to come later let's get back to our heuristics and our personal principles and i think we are kind of moving a bit more to sort of sort of some um, more personal ones uh because there are just some other things that when i'm deck building i feel like this is a huge thing for me so i've got to put it into this episode for sure is just the idea that not all card categories are equal when deck building. And Dana, I feel like this is also maybe a vibe that you've shared with me before, but you also might think that I'm crazy. We'll find out. Um, Specifically, there are some different categories of cards that are kind of like mantras that it feels like we always need. You know, you want to have certain types of removal. You want to have things like card advantage. You want to have lands in your deck, obviously. And using custom categories can be really, really important to help figure out what your deck is doing and what different, you know, pillars of your deck are up to. But I don't think that each one of those pillars should be exactly even. If your commander, for example, is something like a Rakdos the Showstopper, which destroys a bunch of creatures when it enters, that means that you can kind of go a little bit farther away. You can skimp on things like big removal spells because your commander is already doing that for you. If your commander draws like 80 cards a turn, like AC Ova, AC and Tatiova, sorry, I forgot that they were two different cards, that can be something that signals that maybe you don't need as many card draw spells in your deck because your commander is already doing that for you. So you want to spend the spell slots in a completely different way in your deck. Those categories aren't always equal because your commander plays a role in how significant those categories are. Yeah, there's a recent um, version of this, Joey, that came up in a deck I built. I had recently built a Silum Guard the Drifting Death deck, uh, who's a commander that when he attacks, it gives creatures a defending player controls minus one, minus one for each dragon you control. And I have ways to make things into dragons in that deck. Uh, that's a deck that probably needs a little bit less ways to deal with creatures because Every time my commander swings at somebody, I can take out any one ones they control. And the more dragons I have, the more stuff I can sweep away. So Mm. I still have board wipes in that deck, but I'm not as concerned about it in that deck as I am in a different one. So that is a situation where I would be able to categorize my commander as creature removal um, and and run a little bit less. Yeah, well, and Joey, you mentioned AC Tyrant of Gary Straits. That Simic commander is absolutely bonkers, and I I did get that pre-con. I took kind of the, the, the draw spells out of the deck. 
<laughs> not entirely, but a lot of them. Yeah. Because, I mean, that, that commander is just so absolutely insane that ramp spells are your draw spells. That's kind of what the, the commander turns everything into. Right. So I indeed did take out a lot of the draw spells because you don't really need them. Like, sure, you get a couple for the early game, but you don't want to see them too often because you're just better off just playing another ramp spell to get more resources, get your card draw, and just keep that engine going. So yeah, you are absolutely right. Sometimes if your commander excels in a certain role so well, you can kind of give up on other aspects of it. I know we mentioned Corvold earlier, but Corvold, the, the Jund Dragon, has a similar type of effect where he's just so very, very powerful at doing exactly what he does that you can kind of skimp on some of the other aspects of the deck building process because your commander's already doing it and you always have access to your commander. Yeah, it, it, for Corvold, he's not like, oh, I'd better get some black draw spell and pay life spells in here. I gotta no. get those classics. No, he's like, I don't even know if I really want those because... Like, well, first of all, green's got, uh, green is practically primary in card draw, let's be real these days. But also, Corvold is like, if you make treasures for me, I will draw cards that way instead. Treasures are card draw to me, so let's get more of those. I want more nom noms, because that's going to fulfill that category instead. So you can skimp on the more traditional aspects of that category. You don't need the the classic 10 and 10 of each of those categories when he's going to f fulfill you so much for getting you just a bunch of little goblins to snack on. Well, and here's why that winds up being important. Um, the reality is, for the most part, you can't run that many of the cards that you kind of ideally want to run in a commander deck. There's usually not really enough room. If you're playing a Demir deck and you're looking at it and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm devoting 36 to 38 slots to lands and I want to have, you know, X removal spells and in, in 10 mana rocks and 20 some creatures and, you know, 10 draw sources and whatever. Very quickly, you're at 120 cards and <laughs> don't have room for all of that stuff. Um, you know, I have, I, I use Demir for an example because usually you assume in a Demir deck, you're going to be running some amount of counter spells. I have a blue black Demir deck with no counter spells because there's not enough room for counter spells in that deck. I had to choose to omit one thing because I just didn't have available slots. And, and mm -hmm. that's why it's useful to know what slots a commander, for example, can allow you to skimp on because it helps make it easier to wedge the maximum amount of things you need into a deck that really usually doesn't have room for 110 cards because math. Well, and I think yes. that might be why some of those commanders like Corvold Faker's King are so popular because they kind of let players make these deck building mistakes by skimping on certain areas that if they're playing any other commander in Jund Colors, they'd be punished for. But they're not because Corvold, you're, you're just moving that effect from the 99 into the command zone. And, and, and like I said, you have access to your commander literally every game. You may not draw a card X, Y, or Z in the, in the deck, but you're always going to be able to cast your commander. And I think that's why some of these commanders are so popular because you're moving such a staple kind of category from the deck into the command zone. And that's just such a hard thing to overlook. And and you mentioned there like the word mistake, which I think can be maybe interpreted as kind of a loaded word. And I think that there is like, I agree with your argument that a mistake, quote unquote, like that can be totally overridden if your commander is doing so much sure. for you. But that is also kind of the point of this particular like this, this heuristic for me is that at, there is a point at which it is not a mistake where that is the correct move because of what the commander is able to do. And I'll kind of uh, pull from personal experience here. I've got my Conrad deck that I mentioned and who I love and stop playing graveyard hate against me, Dana. It's too specific. You shouldn't be playing it. You said so. Um, Conrad is my damage dealer in that deck. I don't need to overload the deck with tons of win conditions because he's really going to be the central facet of all of those. Or Marin is another one. Marin, by reviving creatures from my graveyard and putting them right into play, that is a form of card advantage that I don't need to worry about too much in a bunch of other areas. So I can focus more on removal. Removal is huge for me in my Marin deck because I'm constantly getting things back out, but my opponents aren't. So I can load up my removal category in my Marin deck is probably like enormous compared to the rest of the other categories because every piece of removal that I get can also be something that I quote get card advantage back from by pulling it back out of the yard over and over and over again. So removal is just a way more important category in that deck than any of the other categories because of the way my commander works with them. Well, those commanders function like a bag of holding does in Dungeons and Dragons. A bag of holding <laughs> is a bag that lets you put 
larger things inside than a bag should naturally hold. Corvald, commanders like that, allow you to run functionally 110 cards in a 100-card deck, basically, because it does what you need. So it is the bag of holding commander. So the Corvold of holding is what we There we're... we go, yep. Or the bag uh, of no. Corvolding. Uh, no, see, Dana, you're actually mistaken. Bag of holding is actually a one-mana artifact from uh, Force okay. of One T. You got me. Uh, whenever you discard a card, you exile that card from your hand, and then you can pay two mana. Okay, I'm going to be done. Joey's going <laughs> to get a, Joey's going to get an ultra sleeve now of himself as a bag of holding. That's what we're going to do for him for mocking mm. my bag of holding analogy. No, I refuse. <laughs> but no, you bring up an excellent point there. And yeah, like there are ways in which you can stuff even more into a deck because the weight that your commander is given to its own category allows you to skimp on some of the other categories a little bit because you just don't need to pay as much attention to them. And that can be a really big lesson. I think that having like a, oh, I got to meet my quota of every category can be sometimes a dangerous mindset to have when you're building a commander deck because some categories are more important to you than other categories might be. Yeah, absolutely. That's a real good point. Yeah. All right, Dana, take us to your next point here, because this is another one that really, really fascinates me. And it's all about conventional wisdom and how it may not all be so wise after all, question mark. Yeah, this is something I actually wrote an article uh, about on EDH Rec some time ago. And it's basically you shouldn't get too attached to the conventional wisdom about what each color is good at doing, because that can make you forget that particularly in EDH, um, what each color is good at doing isn't necessarily the same as what people assume it is in standard. And to give you a, a couple examples here, um, generally everyone assumes black is the color of removal. So if you're playing a Demir deck, you should probably have a bunch of black removal spells. Except mono blue <laughs> in EDH has things like Pongify for one mana and Rapid Hybridization for one mana and Reality Shift for two mana. And now we just got Resculpt for two mana. That's also fantastic. And all four of those might be better than any single target removal spell for creatures that Black has access to because an EDH leaving those tokens behind isn't nearly as scary as it is in a standard environment. So the conventional wisdom of Black being the color of targeted creature removal doesn't always necessarily apply when you're looking at things in commander yeah well we we talked you know for years and years growing up it was well green just has big you know big green creatures just monsters that's all it does but that's kind of shifted now you know you have very very good options to draw cards in green breaking news at 11 uh, <laughs> but like it used to be like harmonize even when i first got back into the game around theros time you know harmonize was such a powerful card you know four mana in green to draw three cards that they, they used to be considered a color pie break. But <laughs> these days you have rich cards expertise. You have great hands. You have all these amazing options to draw cards that now it's, it's not so much the case that green just has monsters. It has more monsters than you have anything in your deck. Well, and this is another good example of a situation where like the standard conventional wisdom doesn't necessarily apply. And by standard, I mean standard the format because looking back at Eldraine, Eldraine gave us the Great Henge and Return of the Wildspeaker, both of which are absolute bombs in EDH that were in the same standard set simultaneously and nobody cared. Yeah. <laughs> because what's a really good green draw spell in EDH is kind of a mediocre card in standard, but when you put it over into our environment, you know, green being mediocre at draw suddenly changes in the in the, this different environment and turns into something that's um, almost better than what any other color, color can offer. I, I have an Elegith Cryo Sphinx. I think maybe it's Cryo Sphinx. I have Ele Elegith is my Scry Sphinx dude. And when I would Scry, he will instead draw me cards. And I love that deck. I love that deck so much because when you play stuff like Ugin's Insight, it's really, really funny to scry like six, but then you draw six and then Ugin's Insight also says you draw three more. That's wonderful. It's great. It, that is so much extra effort for me to get the same amount of card draw as Matt playing <laughs> a regular Rish Cards Expertise or Return to the Wild Speed. Right. Green is primary in card draw. I say that in jest, but I'm not even really joking. Like I will see mono green decks draw more cards than mono blue decks regularly. And that is concerning. Well, it, and, and it, it translates to a bunch of things. When people talk about board wipes, you always assume, you know, white has the most, so therefore it must have the best ones. Although black has a bunch of really good ones too, so therefore definitely either white or black has the best board wipes, right? Well, Blasphemous Act in red <laughs> is very frequently just a single red mana to wipe the board. That's insane. And it was a card that didn't really 
care and standard. It was it was dirt cheap and almost nobody ran it. Similarly, Chandra's Ignition at five mana is not dirt cheap, but it wins games. Like there's a bunch of decks where your commander is routinely huge in red, and Chandra's Ignition not only wipes the board, it just kills people. So there's plenty of times where like red has the best board wipes for your deck again despite those two cards not being relevant in standard really yeah you haven't lived until you've cast chandra's ignition onto valdic keeper the flame while he's holding a loxodon warhammer yeah um <laughs> sure, yeah. i i i think that might have been like my peak and it's all been downhill since but <laughs> that was quite a moment to be on top <laughs> That is um, disgusting. Please don't do it to us again. You, you, people said, you know, you can't gain life in mono red, but I proved them wrong. <laughs> so, so Matt, that's that's just it, though. Um, this was really explained very poetically, I think, uh, by Elaine. On Twitter, you can find her at Oritart. Um, she's very, very wise when it comes to magic. I've learned a lot from her, but a really beautiful thing that she mentioned was about the ways that players experience the color pie. Dana, you brought up the example of Wrath of God and how we kind of like always get white board wipes in every single set. Like that is a part of the color pie for white, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best board wipes. So what players actually play are a little bit different. And that's something that Elaine hit on so so very very nicely is that the ways that players actually experience the gameplay from those things, that is also a very significant part of the color pie as well. Not just what can this color do? Can this color gain life? Can this color wipe the board? But also the best things that people are doing and that they're actually playing is another huge facet to how the color pie works in general. And in your examples here, as you've brought up, I mean, if there's a Demir deck and I'm looking for removal spells, I'm leaning more towards picking the blue removal spells than I am for the black removal spells, even though blacks quote the color of removal. That's fascinating. Well, an example of that too, the experience thing, especially, you know, a white is technically tertiary in, in counter spells, and it's got a few of them over the years, things like, like lapse of memory or mana tithe that do see a little bit of play in commander, I guess. Um, but ask the average person how many times they've <laughs> seen a Veil of Summer get cast, particularly in Standard when it was around, and it probably very much feels to them, in terms of what they experience, that green <laughs> has, is the tertiary color when it comes to counter spells. So yeah, that, I mean, she phrased that very elegantly. What the color pie says is not the same as what the players experience. Yeah, I, I do remember that thread, and I, I have nothing else to add, but it was it, it was very, very wise, like you said, Joey. And yeah, how people actually get to see these colors playing out uh, in the actual games. It doesn't matter how many symmetrical white card draw spells we get. Like, if they're not great, then white isn't really leading the, the card draw field, for example. So... Yeah, it's, it's all about what people are actually getting a chance to experience in their games. And that's kind of what is going to kind of shape that uh, the thought process of the, the community at large. Yeah. So, Dana, really great point. Thank you for bringing it to the fore for us to discuss here. Don't get too wrapped up in conventional wisdom about what belongs in certain things. This color does that. This color does that. Because sometimes the most efficient things might actually be color bends, color breaks. And that is a way that we get to experience those colors. So, the conventional wisdom isn't always wise, and uh, I think that means that I'm wise then, right? Nah, I don't you're, think so. You're, you're conventionally, conventionally wise, Joey. We'll put it that way. Well, I, I think <laughs> the, the, the wise thing that I'm going to bring to this podcast, I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm going to bring Joey's <laughs> reign to an end. And speaking of ending, um, games do have to end. That's like one thing that I th feel a lot of players overlook is the fact that not every game is going to last perpet in, you know, in perpetuity. Uh, games have to end. And my big thing is just how are you helping the game end? What are you doing? What is your game plan as far as helping the games move along and not just kind of sit there and everybody kind of you know spins their wheels for a while? This is a great point. First of all, it's a great point for us to be finishing on games got to end at the end of the show. <laughs> Well plotted, Matt. I love what you did there. But yeah, this is kind of hearkening back a little bit to like value isn't victory. Like if we're all drawing cards and gaining life, that can be certainly enjoyable. And having that laissez-faire game is really nice. But also like we don't want to necessarily be playing a game of Commander for two hours. And there are some commanders who left to their own regular devices might just kind of go on for two hours. Like Olero Aegis Ascetic comes to mind where he's just like, I'm passively gaining life. You got to do some work to make him properly lethal. That's a thing that's very important. 
Yeah. Um, an example I, I can think of that we kind of touched on before is you talked about Brago decks, Joey, having to run things like Resonator just to have a win condition in the deck. Um, my co-host and Commander Central, Max, has a Brago deck, and one thing he found that worked very nicely in that deck for him was Approach of the Second Sun. Because of the way Brago works, you could cast on your main phase, untap all your mana rocks, and your Mull Drifter that you blink and all your things that let you draw down to hit the approach on your second main phase and use those mana rocks to cast it again for the win on that one turn. That's not something most decks have built in the way to both cast it and have enough mana to recast it, let alone draw down to it, but Brago kind of does. So like he's figured out a way in that deck to make approach work really, really well. It's one of his win conditions. And you just need to think about that and think about how you're going to close things out. And, and I, I think that's a very elegant one in that deck. Yeah, we think about all these decks that kind of do a whole lot of nothing, not quite like Null Rod nothing, but, you know, the, the knowledge pool and Teferi type of setups oh. where mm -hmm. you set up this lock and, and, you know, people don't really get to do anything. Well, well, that's all fine and dandy, but how are you actually going to end the game? Like you've stalled the game very, very well. But you, everybody else just kind of ends up sitting there. So what is your game plan once you have that knowledge pool combo in play? What are you doing to make sure the games are actually ending besides people leaving because they're slashing your tires and, and very, very <laughs> frustrated with what you just did? Is that the level of impatience that you get to? Uh, after like the fourth or fifth time, maybe. I, I could use a curveball every now and then. <laughs> Uh, scary. Remind me not to uh, annoy you in a game of, of Commander. <laughs> people, or at least not annoy you when your car's around. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, man. No, that, that's a really great example, though. Like, there are totally those things that, like, you can establish a very firm lock on the game. That is not victory, though. The Teferi right. Knowledge Pool is a great example of it. You've got to find a way for that to actually become lethal. I also think of uh, Maelstrom Wanderer is another example. That's a commander that cascades. And a really efficient thing that sometimes Maelstrom Wanderer players will do is cascade into something like a Yokel Hops and just annihilate all of the resources on the board, including lands. But then sometimes people will be like, all right, well, I'm also going to counter your Maelstrom Wanderer, for example. Or I'm going to save up mana, and then when it hits the field, I'll remove it. I'll exile it. And then no one has a board. So you did the thing and it would have kind of had a plan, but there's nothing left in play. Do you have backup plans for that instance? Because you kind of stalled the game out without necessarily guaranteeing victory. And you got to spend time making sure that the victory is a lot more assured. Yeah. And, and if this is the type of game that you and your play group enjoy, like by all means, do your thing. Of course. Um, but just be, be aware, like this is the type of thing that if you have your, your knowledge pool combo set up or you're, you're, you pull off the Yoko hops with Maelstrom on and it gets answered, Make sure you're at least aware that, you know, you're setting up this thing. And so you want to be speeding things along. You don't want to just make the game unenjoyable for the rest of the table for however many hours it takes to get out from underneath that. Have a, some sort of a plan to win the game on your own as well. Yeah, very well said. Games have got to end. Having a plan is really, really important. So make sure that that is not just a piece of your gameplay, but also a piece of your deck building. Games got to end. And you know what? So do shows. So with that, what I think we're going to do is call this episode to a close. Fellas, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing all of these cool heuristics or principles that you bring to the EDH tables. And if our listeners would like to get in touch with you to maybe learn a little bit more about them, where is it that they can find you all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming uh, twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast this upcoming uh, Wednesday. We do have Joseph Johnson. We're very much looking forward to that. But we have great guests every single week, so make sure you don't miss a single stream. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can hear me once a week on my other podcast, CMDR Central. And I write articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us on patreon.com slash EDHRecCast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. And you can find the cast at EDHRecCast on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you have a question for us or a keen insight to EDHREC's data, you can contact us at EDHRecCast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to the entire team at the Command Zone, who handle all of the post-production work on our podcast here. And of course, we have to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com and Altersleeves.com. You can find them using the price info links on EDHREC or visiting CardKingdom.com slash EDHREC or by visiting Altersleeves.com slash EDHREC track and that shows your support for the show listeners we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights but until then remember edh wreck your deck before you wreck your deck <laughs>